So I'm going to follow right along with you guys, and we'll, we'll put it out on Twitter after the session, okay? So if you've got a laptop in your lap, you might want to set it down. <laughs> okay? All right, so let's do a dry run real quick, okay? We're going to start right here, so follow along with my, with my thumb. This isn't it. We're going to do it one more time and get it right. Ready, set, go. Woo! Yes! Oh, this is amazing! <laughs> wow! Okay. Here we go. We ready? Yo, you ready? You're gonna like lead the whole thing. One, two, one, two three, go! Today, obviously, we're talking about a big passion of mine. So we're talking about ditch that textbook, which doesn't necessarily mean like uh, we hate textbooks, we're anti-textbooks. But I think these days, with all of the options and all the technology and all the different best practices we have available, I think getting outside of the textbook is more of a reality now than it ever has been. And there's so much that we can do for our kids. And so there's just so much I think that we can do. And so. We're going to talk a little bit about that whole idea. Um, I've been writing a blog called Ditch That Textbook for about two and a half years. And then for a little over two months, I've had this book, Ditch That Textbook. Um, 
out, and it's something that came right out of my own classroom. About six years ago, I just quit using textbooks in my class, just because I thought that they were a hurdle or a stumbling block to what I really wanted to do. I'm a high school Spanish teacher. And so we started engaging in technology and having discussions and conversations in Spanish in class, and it was huge. It was game changing for me. And so that's why I wrote the book, because I'm so excited about the idea of teachers taking control of their classes and not letting it be dictated by, by a textbook. And so that's, that's kind of the idea of what we're going to be talking about today. And if you think that you've come to a sit and get session, you are sadly mistaken. <laughs> because this is all going to be about all of you. This is a back channel conversation. And so what that means is, in fact, let me tell you exactly what that does mean. How does this work? The questions are going to appear on the screen. I'm curious, how many of you have a Twitter account? You're going to put it to use today. OK, so that's good. Second question, all of you, those of you with a Twitter account, how many of you have participated in a Twitter chat? OK, this is very much like a Twitter chat if, you, if you've ever done it. If you haven't, it's really easy. I'm going to put the question up here. I'll talk about it very briefly. And then after that, it'll all be about the discussion going on digitally. And so there are a couple places you can participate. If you have Twitter, type your answers. So if I ask the first question, you're going to type an A1 in front of your answer to show that you're answering the first question. Type your answer or your thought. And then make sure that you include the DTT ISC 2015. That's like ditch that textbook, ISC 2015 hashtag in your tweet. As long as that's in there, everybody's going to be able to see that conversation. Or if you don't have Twitter, we still love you. But you really need to get a Twitter account. And so you can go here instead, todaysmeet.com slash DTTISD. And so that's the place where the conversation is going to be going on. So it's not just, I mean, has anybody ever heard of the, the question, who is the smartest person in the room? Who is the smartest person in the room? The room. The room, exactly. So you don't want just what's coming out of one brain. We want all of these brains working collectively. And so reply to others, let's make it a conversation. Another thing that's cool about this is this right here. This. Chromebook is connected. I'm showing this to all the people who aren't here. This Chromebook is connected to a Google Hangout on air that is broadcasting. I had, I think we had as many as 40 people signed up to say that they were going to do it. Everybody give them a wave. Thank you. Very good. And so they're going to be chiming in. So there's a good chance that some of the answers to the questions are going to be coming from outside of this room, from potentially anywhere in the world, which is so cool, just by itself. So. Without further ado, let's get into the conversation. So here's question one. How is the role of textbooks changing? How or why are they more relevant or less relevant in classrooms? So if you have some thoughts on that, head off to Twitter, start typing in your ideas, make sure you use this hashtag, or if you're in today's meet, you want to go here. And so while you're if you if you can't type in the thing, then just type in ignore. <laughs> but if you're not typing, I'm going to give you a thought on my own personal thought on this. I think that textbooks are sort of like these instruments of education from the past. This is just my own personal view. That we needed them to be in print because we didn't have any other way of delivering the content, any better way of delivering the content. But these days things are changing. And once textbooks went into print, they're fixed, they're in ink, they can't change, and a lot of times they're outdated as soon as they hit our desks. And so I think there are, there are lots of different ways, and you're seeing that at this conference, aren't you? There are so many different ways that we can and use to pull kids in and, and connect with them. So that's kind of my two cents on it. So, never done this before, so we're going to see how it goes. I'm kind of excited about it. All right, so here we are already. So I want to see what some of you have to say. And you'll be able to see down here in the corner some of these as they come in. So we'll click on live here so we can see everything. My experience with the shift, common core math textbooks are becoming irrelevant and not rigorous enough. 
Do we have that opportunity to change the amount of rigor, to change the, the challenge? I love that. Use less dated materials, not keeping up with real-time resources. They are no longer the end-all, end all, absolutely. Textbooks are not flexible enough for today's learners. Flexible, I think that's such, a, that's such a key. Because, I mean, we can go in with digital resources. We can go in and we can change things all the way up to the minute. We can customize them for kids. That's, that's huge. Textbooks are keeping teachers teaching the same old stuff, which is so far removed from what our students do. They're always evolving forward. Um, has anybody ever heard of Don Wetrick before? Who kind of took Genius Hour? Yeah, took Genius Hour, you know, the, the pursuing your passions for 20% of the time to full time. He's got a class where kids do that. And one of his big things is he says, it's okay if you teach for 20 years, but it's not okay if you teach one year 20 times. I love that. That is so true. So textbooks are static and archaic. There is no engagement. Daniela is like singing my song. <laughs> So, Terry says they're becoming obsolete, they're digital versions, but it's difficult to keep up. Now, of course, as we're doing this, if you see something that really resonates with you, obviously favorite it, maybe retweet it out to your followers, and of course, this is a conversation, so click that reply button and throw back your ideas, too. Let's, let's really, make it, really make it a conversation. Curriculum and materials are everywhere now. We don't really have to rely on just one source any longer. Absolutely. If we can pull in those, those perspectives and the different, the different angles on information from, from all different sources, then, I mean, for goodness sake, why wouldn't we? So yeah, that's, that's awesome. So, okay, about time for us to switch. Question two, why should classes become more digital? What are the benefits? I get the feeling that if I'm asking that question, I'm kind of preaching to the choir here. <laughs> if we're all here at the ISTE conference. As you're answering that, follow up on question one. This is from the Today's Meet. Students are collecting and learning from multiple sources. We should do the same when teaching. Absolutely. I love that. Curriculum, curriculum needs to be living. It needs to change. Textbooks cannot do that. Textbooks have value when know-how and learning are measured by the pound or kilo metric system. That's great. I love how that how that got worded. You need to go from paper to media. Digital is where the kids are. That's something we're going to talk about in this in this presentation. I mean, if that's where kids are, I don't know if I'm going to save it. <laughs> I could go on and on about that one, but I'm going to save it for a little bit later. So, okay. So our second question here is why should classes become more digital? What are the benefits? I can tell you a couple of them that have, that have come from me, at least. One is I'm more efficient when I'm digital because I'm able to put all of my information out on my class website or Google Classroom or your learning management system. It's all right there. It's searchable where all of my paper stuff, obviously, is not searchable. The only way you can search through it is look, 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 look through, through lots of papers. And so, that's one place. Another one is I want my students to learn what it's like to engage online with different people. I think that's such an important skill coming in the future. And if we're if we're taking our classes more digital, that's the that's the perfect place to be able to do that. I know, I know some people don't like the idea of the term 21st century learning and 21st century skills, but I mean that's those are skills of the future, if you if you want to call it that. It's skills of today, today as well. So all right, let's see what you guys are saying. Like I said, I don't want this to be a monopoly where I'm the only one who's talking, so. All right, so let's see what we've got. Go back up to the top. I need to get on getting these questions online, because <laughs> I've only got the first one on so far. We've got 77 new results. Holy cow, we might make DTT a C2015 trend. <laughs> That would totally make my Philly trip. <laughs> no idea. I would screenshot that. I might put it up in my bedroom. I don't care what my wife says. <laughs> okay, we'll do. We'll just keep that between us. Okay. All right. Digital learning is when students collaborate and connect as often as they would like educational freedom. Think about what kids do. What a lot of kids, your preteens, your teens, and even some of them below that. They've got these digital devices, and what are they doing with them? 
they're texting, they're on social media, they're sharing pictures, they're sharing information, they're looking things up. I mean, we've got this opportunity to make our classes look like that too. And I think the more that we can pull that in, the more relevant we are with their lives. Connect to the world and break down walls. Real world connections, absolutely. Personalized, relevant, real. Says Wikipedia is not a relevant resource. It's a class to use 20 year old textbooks. <laughs> that will make so easy to pull it up. That's totally true. Yep. <laughs> Love it. Thank you, Katie. Nicely done. Totally true. All right. This is what kids are doing today. I want to see this picture of that. Better organized, larger audience level playing field. Talk about that larger audience. We bring our class online. Think about it. If, you're, if your kids are blogging, let's say, they're writing in those online journals, and you open that blog up to be public, turn on your comment moderation, turn, turn on your post moderation, so you can make sure that the only thing that comes that gets published is, is all positive. But if we turn that public, oh my goodness, they can get feedback, and they can get perspectives and comments from potentially all over the world. If we take their, for example, if we take their blogs and we share them, share them out on social media, I mean, have you have your Wish I could talk How many of you have heard of the hashtag comments for kids? Only a few of you. Okay. If you ever, if your students ever create anything online and you want to get feedback from people outside of your school to encourage them, you can take the link to it, the link to that student work, be it a blog or a class website or whatever. Put it on the Twitter. Add that link with a hashtag comments, the number four kids. And you have people, literally, worldwide, who will come into that hashtag who want to encourage kids to write and to produce and to help them think. And so you put something out there where you've got a commenting feature, and you could get comments from Boston or LA or Kansas or Venezuela or Puerto Rico or Russia or someplace in Africa. Because, I mean, that's, that's the way that, that social media is. You've got people who are caring who want to do that for kids, which is awesome. Better organized, larger. Yeah, we just talked about that. Oh, there's Craig Yen. By the way, speaking of not at ISTE, anything you guys know about the not at ISTE hashtag? People who are not at ISTE follow along with ISTE on Twitter so they can learn right along with us. And so Craig is not at ISTE, but he's participating, which I think is awesome. So he says, we want them to be able to connect to the outside world, provide them with those opportunities. Let's look at this day's meet real fast. By the way, have I said yet that you guys are killing it? <laughs> this is great. Digital enables connectivity and participation like nobody's business. Comment for kids is wonderful. Yes, digital is more about leverage, time, resources, effort. Oh, yeah, connecting with others. Absolutely. I love that. That, that sums it up right there. That word, leverage. It's doing more with what you have. That's huge. Digital is more, I just wrote that. <laughs> That's where society is going. Why not send our students there? I mean, for goodness sake, education is on a path to irrelevance, isn't it? If we keep doing things the way, the way that we've been doing them, it's been set up for a whole different age, a whole different time. And now we're in such a different world, and if we keep doing education the same way, we're just not providing those skills for our kids. Less paper. That's enough raising right there. <laughs> Less tra trips to the copy machine. I've got to say, I do not miss the copy room. <laughs> Once I've gone more paperless, I do not miss it a bit. So, okay, let's go on to question three. What are some digital spaces? Talk about going to where kids are. What are some digital spaces our students love? You don't have to say the ones that you necessarily use in class. I'm just thinking about the kids. What are some digital spaces our students love and the benefits of taking our classes there? Take just a second to do that. I'm actually going to do my job. <laughs> I'm going to tweet that question out for people who are following along on Twitter. So digital spaces my students love. 
One of them, obviously, is Twitter. Twitter and Instagram, social media in general. And so a neat experience that I got to be a part of was, pretty sure this was not this last school year, but the school year before. OK, so I'm from Indiana, real rural, agricultural-based area. So my kids love to hunt. They love to fish. They love to be outdoors. And when we're talking about TV, guess what show they love? Duck Dynasty, yes. Of course, that, that may have been so last year. They may not be so much with it anymore. But so we have homecoming, you know, the, the big the big football game of the of the football season, where everybody does all the special activities. And we have certain dress up days. And one of them, because our school was so bonkers about Duck Dynasty, we had a Duck Dynasty dress up day. Kids in camo, big ghillie suits. I had a kid who had an official, if you watch that guy, he had an official Cy Robertson tea jug and teacup. I mean, like, the plastic one that he actually uses. And so we were talking about relationships with the family in Spanish, the, you know, like, mother, father, sister, brother, those words. We charted out the, um, the family tree on the board, and I thought, hey, we're all dressed up like that dynasty. Let's get next to that with all of our stuff, take a picture, and tweet it to some of the guys from the show. So we did. And if you watch the show, Jace Robertson, who the main character, Willie, is his brother, saw it and retweeted it. Jace has, a, at the time, had a little more than a million Twitter followers. My kids went off the walls. I mean, they went nuts. I mean, they, they, they talked about it for a week. And whenever they come into my class for the next several days, they say, how many retweets are we up to? How many favorites are we up to? We ended up with something like 120 retweets and 200 favorites, something crazy like that. And so that's one place where we got into their spaces. And it was huge, and they loved it. Talk about engagement. I mean, that, that did it for them. So let's see some of the things that you guys have to say. All right. So spaces that kids love. Vine and YouTube. You pull in those little six-second videos, A, they can get really creative whenever you get them short constraints. Have you ever notice that? How you constrain things, you make it smaller, and you get some serious creativity. YouTube, absolutely. Instagram, Twitter, Pen Pal Schools, Snapchat are all easily accessible. I gotta tell you, I'm gonna have to maybe get on the Snapchat wagon or keep reading about it, because I can see the power of it, but it scares me about too. So we'll we'll see. I we'll see about that one. And so if, if any of you do Snapchat and do it successfully in class, I would love to hear about it. So Kahoot, quizzes, those are awesome. My third graders love mystery skypes and hangouts. I could talk about that forever. That is that is so huge. Where's Elise? Elise, are you in here? Yeah. Okay, maybe she's someplace else. <laughs> she's not a Misty, I guess. Okay. More info about comments for kids. Minecraft absolutely counts. And that's when, I mean, kids build historically accurate models of places on Minecraft that will blow your mind if you haven't seen a whole lot about, about Minecraft in the classroom. So that is, that is very cool. Let's go on to question four. Here's question four. The importance of global connections. We just talked about Mystery Skype. What is the importance of global connections in the classroom, and how can we make them happen in our classrooms? Getting your class outside of the four walls of your classroom. I want to tell you, as soon as I get this question tweeted out, I want to tell you a little bit about my class. Some of the stuff we did with that. OK, so global connections. I had a Spanish 3 class that I got connected with a class in Valencia, Spain. Spanish-speaking kids, you know, uh, English-speaking kids, both learning each other's languages. I mean, it was a no-brainer. And once a week for about two months, two of my kids got onto an iPad on Skype, two of their kids got onto a laptop on Skype, and they talked. 15 minutes in English, sort of predetermined questions, discussion prompts. 15 minutes in Spanish. The kids from Spain could help my students with their English. The kids from Spain have been studying English a lot longer than my kids from Spanish. They're in Spanish. And in the last 15 minutes, they just talked. They just hung out on Skype. 
I've had some people thinking, well, they didn't have an objective. They didn't have discussion questions. Not oh, before learners. I'll tell you, that was, the, that was the most influential part of the entire process. Because my kids are in an area where there's lots of migrant workers that come in to work in the fields in our area. And the overriding stereotype against them is those migrant workers are all here. All those people who speak Spanish in general are all here because they want to steal our jobs. They're all the time. And I have fought and fought and fought that as a teacher. Lectures didn't work. <laughs> Shocking. Lectures didn't work on teenagers. <laughs> it just changed their mind. Discussions didn't work. Activities didn't work. But put them together with some real live Spanish speaking kids, and they get to see that they're interested in sports. They're interested in boys or girls. And their clothes and all of that stuff. They're interested in the same stuff. And then all of a sudden, the world isn't so big and they're not so different. And a lot of my kids will never get to travel internationally. A lot of them never really leave the state that much. So they probably won't get to a Spanish speaking country, but now they've had an honest to goodness conversation, almost relationship with somebody from another country. Just because we use that. And you know how much it costs, right? After we have the devices and the internet connection? How much does Skype cost? That's right. It's just there for the for the taking. So all right, let's look at global connection. <laughs> And that's something that I could talk about for a while. I get to present at um, schools and conferences all around the state of Indiana and around the country. And that's one of my most my most uh, requested sessions is about connecting, it's called connecting classrooms to the world. Talking about how you can get people into your classroom on that. And that's, I mean, that is a huge passion of mine. I love, love, love talking about that. So, all right, let's look at question four. By the way, you guys have caught on, if you've never done a Twitter chat before and you're participating in this, you're doing it right. So that's great. Keep it up. All right, so there's Sue. By the way, Sue is, is a big supporter of my book, and she, she tweets about it a lot. And she wanted to come to this session, but she's not a DISTI. So now she's in the session. So how cool is that? Well, the connections are very important. I'm contacting previous students who are now teachers who are in house with third grade students. How awesome is that? They were in their exact same position. They were third graders at that same school. And now they're adults. Or imagine if you've got former graduates who you can Skype or Google Hangout into your class to talk about their job. If you're a math teacher and it's relevant to math, oh my goodness. Having somebody who graduated from your school talk about how they're using that exact same math every day in their job to earn real money, that, that really brings it home, you know? So important to show students that they can make a difference and they're not an island and to learn empathy. Think about that. Make a difference. They're not an island to learn into. If they came out of school learning those three lessons, think about what our society would be like if they learned that. Authentic information through digital connections trumps the static textbook. Yes! <laughs> they will remember the experience over the basic facts. Oh my goodness, that is the truth. That's something, how many of you have read or heard about the book Teach Like Fire? Okay, the author of Teach Like Fire, Dave Burgess, that's one of the big, big, big things in his book. He said, we're not in the business of teaching lessons, we're in the business of creating experiences. They'll remember experiences their whole life. We can turn that into an experience that they can feel and that they can see and they can smell. That's the, that's the big thing right there. That's, that's huge. I love that. Let's look at one more real quick. You know what? I'm neglecting our today's new people. Connecting on today's new I'm sorry that I have neglected you like this. Isn't our goal to develop strong, compassionate, critical thinking global citizens? Yes, it is. We can't do that without helping them start a dialogue. It is, it's all about dialogue. Mystery Skype did tune the last week of school this year. Think about that when kids are ready to go on summer break and they're done. You pull in something like that, all of a sudden it, it brings them right back. It brings them right back. I love it. Mystery Skype, opening students' eyes to the world, it opens their minds to more non-biased learning. Think about that. That is that's cool. All right. Let's move on to our next question. Question five. It's supposed to be on question five at 4.40 p.m. It's 
We're doing all right. All right. <laughs> Don't ask my wife about how often I stay on the schedule. It's not pretty. Okay, number five, what are your top tools? Okay, so you come to ISTE, or if you participate in Twitter, these are like the big, everybody geeks out, and everybody has their, their tools. And so this is kind of like a free-for-all. Because this has to do with ditching textbooks too, right? What are your top tools for creating an effective digital learning environment? I'm leaving that broad on purpose. So start throwing in your most powerful, your most powerful tools. I will preface that by saying, of course, I think this has come to be sort of a standard here at the ISTE conference and beyond. It's obviously not about the tools, right? It's about what you do with the tools. You don't go out and look for a construction project where you can use a hammer. I'm looking, I got this new hammer, and I'm looking for something that I can use this hammer on. You don't do that. You look at what you want to build, and then you pick the tools for it, right? Same deal. But you've got to have good tools to build something. We're going to talk about those tools. Question five. Off it goes to Twitter. OK, so one, I've got so many. Um, one of them that I'm really excited about right now is called Formative. It's at goformative.com. Does anybody know about Formative? OK, so here's what Formative does. It takes questions and it sends them out to your students' devices, and everybody answers individually, which is not that huge of a thing because we've got lots of tools that can do that. I use Today's Me to do that. I have all my students answer at the same time. That's quick and easy. You have Socrative or Socrative. Um, that's done that for a long time. What makes Formative different is A, you can draw your answers, which is huge for younger kids. If you want, the, if you want to see their reading comprehension, how well they're comprehending things, but they just don't have the words for it, they can draw it. Math problems that aren't linear, that goes in there very well. And the second big thing is instant feedback. Think about when kids turn things into you, and you grade it, and you get it right back to them the next day, just like you're supposed to. Where do those papers end up? The trash. The trash. On the floor, in the bottom of their locker. Those are the three big ones that I, I see. I've actually had a kid one time take his paper and like stare me down as he's walking by. I do one of these. <laughs> Turn to walk away. And then I see all of that work, all of that red ink that I put on that. Maybe that's why I did it. <laughs> but there goes all of that hard work. And so with this, with, with formative, you can get your you can get a comment about their answer and a score right into their formative account immediately. Same with Google Classroom. If you use Google Apps, Google Classroom will let you put comments on things instantly. That instant feedback, you can catch them while they're still in the moment. Still in the moment of learning, still in the moment of trying to figure it out. They get it back tomorrow, they are way out of that moment. They've been through 500 other moments since then. All right, let's see what you guys think. You guys are participating like channels here. This is awesome. Okay, so we'll come back here. Go live. This is question five. Oh, Craig's back again. <laughs> Not about the tool. Yeah, we were just talking about that. Another tool, tool go formative. Yes, absolutely. Prefer tools that don't. Require students to have accounts. Yes, absolutely. I'm careful about using Facebook, et cetera, because that definitely. And with the accounts ones, you got to be careful of terms of service. Um, we were talking about Vine earlier, those little six second looping videos. If you look into the terms of service there, 17 years old. I looked it up this morning. I think of how many kids are below 17 that have Vine accounts. So they're, they're technically in violation of the terms of service. So. Kahoot, Socrative, Instagram, Kaizena. Kahoot, I mean, has taken off like crazy. How many of you love Kahoot? Look at all the hands. Yeah, absolutely. Last year I found out about it, and you know how you can you can see how many public Kahoots are available up at the top of the screen? Last year it was in the hundreds of thousands last summer. Now it's over two and a half million. It's gone up by two million public Kahoots over the last year. Taken off like crazy. Google Classroom, Edpuzzle. That's great for Flip Classroom. Awesome. Google Apps. <laughs> There's the hammer quote. Yes. Thank you, Joycey. Very good. 
like ping pong for drawing as well. I thought he was messing with me for a second. <laughs> but really, ping pong, okay. Gotcha. Google for EDU, yeah. Formative, yes. You guys come up with good ones. Let's go ahead. Today we can see if we've got anything else. And then we'll go on to the next question. Classroom. Google classroom norms. Clear learning objectives in conjunction with technology. Yeah, absolutely. From one stroke. Theme link, yes. There's go formative right there. Imagination. Whatever lets me show relevant examples and get students interacting. That right there is a focus not on the tool but on the process, right? That's what we want. That is it. Google Drive, Google Classroom, Google, Google, Google. I'm a Google certified teacher. I am sort of a Google geek myself. So. Oh, yeah, I'm now called a Google certified innovator. I just changed that with me last week or two. That's what it takes to get used to. Okay, let's move on to question six. Here we go. What are some textbook mindsets or beliefs? What are some, I sort of butchered the grammar on that one, didn't I? What are some textbook mindsets or beliefs that need to change in education? I mean, I could go, go on and on about this one. Um, but one of my big ones, okay, I'm going to start, if I start preaching here, <laughs> I apologize, I'll try, to, I'll try not to go, go too overboard, is for me, the idea that school provided professional development is the end all be all in professional learning. I have never heard a kid say, I can't use that tablet or I can't use that cell phone. I haven't had any professional development on it. <laughs> <laughs> never heard a kid say that before. Because these days we have what? We have Google searches, we have YouTube. Okay, show of hands, how many of you have looked up how to do something on YouTube before? Yes, that's what I thought. Kids are doing it too. That's something that we can leverage as well. All right, so take a second and put your thoughts in there if you haven't already. There's a question on Twitter. All right, let's see some of your answers. Somebody remind me at the end of the session to check and see if PTT SD 2015 is trending, okay? <laughs> Please remind me, I just want to check. I won't be too disappointed if we're not, but I still hope that we are. Set amount of content to cover. Yes, that is absolutely a mindset that's got to change. The textbook is the curriculum. <laughs> you know, when I was a brand new teacher, that's the way it was. I didn't know any different. I came in and there was no curriculum set whatsoever, and I had a, a big stack of textbooks. And that's all I had to go from. And so, yeah, that the textbook does not have to be your curriculum. You know your students so much better than a textbook company thousands of miles away from you. That's, that's my thought on that one. You have to get it right the first time and the failing is bad. Yeah, that's one that's got to change too. What's that acronym, that FAIL acronym? First Attempt in Learning. You've never heard that before. FAIL, First Attempt in Learning. And I, I fail in front, I don't know about you, but I fail in front of my students all the time. We try an activity or we try a lesson and it'll blow up in my face. The Skype thing that we did with the, the students in Valencia, Spain, first two weeks that we tried it, no Skype connections whatsoever. There was something in our network that wouldn't let us get out on Skype. And it just, it, it didn't work. Most parents tend to be clueless or scared of technology and social media. It's our job to teach how to use effectively. So what you're saying is that we need to teach the parents too. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, why not? Drill and kill. Yes, absolutely get it. Very good. If only my students could have devices in the classroom. Yeah, there, there are so many ways around that, definitely. <laughs> Lots of learning connected for me to, to Burgess State. They did publish my book. We do have an awful lot in common, I think. So, all right, very good. This has been great. This is great so far. Let's switch to today's meet real fast. Lecture and take notes, yes. Now, I totally agree with that, but that said, how many of you have sat in on some fascinating lecturers before? Yeah, 
The teacher right across the hall from me that taught US history and world history for like 30 years, he was a fascinating lecturer on certain topics. And on other ones, the lecture totally fell flat. If that's your only tool, not a good way to go. But lecture can be fascinating, can it? Because it's storytelling. That's what it is. Very good. Textbook and teacher, the only source of information, yeah. How many of you have your kids sometimes look at different sources to try to find where the textbook is wrong? Or where the source is wrong? Does anybody do that? Yeah, I mean, I've heard of some people doing that before, where if they can find inaccurate, I've heard people say they'll give extra credit if you can find inaccuracies in the textbook, which really causes kids to think twice about the textbook being the only source, right? Yeah. Textbooks and digital resources shouldn't be used together. I don't know. I kind of think that's a blended classroom. I'm, I can see it. I can see textbooks being used. I haven't ditched that textbook guy, but, you know. Use it use as a resource from time to time. I like hear this too often. We all we like all the supplementals that come with the textbook and adoption. Yeah, absolutely. I've got lots of supplementals too. It's called the internet. <laughs> Textbooks are all, one resource, but they're not encompass and authentic learning experience. Yes, 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 absolutely. All right, very good. Let's go to question seven. We're getting there. We have four questions left. What skills will be crucial to prepare students for jobs that don't even exist yet? I wouldn't be surprised if you've heard this thought, jobs that don't even exist yet. But if you haven't, I mean, think about that, even if you have. Because think about some of the jobs that are out there right now. Social media marketing, that didn't exist 10 years ago. Uh, sustainability, energy sustainability manager, that didn't exist years ago. Social media managers, I mean, think about that. You can, you can earn sometimes six figures as a social media manager for a big company. I mean, how many of you would take six figures to hang out on Pinterest all day? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So if we, have, if we don't involve, we don't allow kids to, to get ready for that. And so some skills, I think, are timeless. Regardless of what fads and education come and go and as the, the jobs change. So what do you think some of those some of those are. I'm curious to see what your <laughs> thoughts are there. So for me, one of those crucial skills is hard work. That's not going to change, is it? So if we see kids doing exceptional extra work to try to do something that matters to them, I think that gets praised, for me at least, way more than if they get the correct answer. Correct answers come and go. I think that's, that, that's one of those huge skills that's so important to me at least. And again, I want to see what, what some of you were saying about this. So here we go. Ooh, we're up to 100, more than 100 since the last time. Adaptability. That's like, that's the sum of the whole experience, isn't it? Absolutely. Problem solving and the ability to communicate using multiple platforms. Platforms are going to come and go, aren't they? When I was in college, I was a journalism major at Indian State University, and I had a class called Computers in Journalism that was going to prepare me for technology in my career. You know what we say stuff on? I Omega Zip Discs. <laughs> you guys remember those? Yeah. Those went out, I think, before I even graduated. That's what we were saving things on to get us ready. Critical thinking and problem solving. Creativity, resilience. You need to just make this list, and then I think that becomes our curriculum, you know? Right there. Creativity. Absolutely. I just think Michael and Sir Ken Robinson will get along very well. Collaboration, creation, project man management, analysis. In all of those surveys that they do of workforce skills that employers really want, what always goes to the top? Communication, problem solving, teamwork. 
those three seem to be right at the top every single time. And our outdated, some of those outdated classes that still have her around, what are they getting you ready for? Know the right answer. It kind of goes back to the last time that education was overhauled around the time of the Industrial Revolution, where we needed good factory workers who would come in and would clock in, would go to their stations, and would turn widgets all day, and then clock out and leave. You know what I'm talking about? That's pretty much what our education system looks like anymore, isn't it? You come in, you sit down, you sit quietly, you do your work, you listen, you obey, you comply, and then you go home. And this stuff, critical thinking, problem solving, working as a team, creativity, that's the stuff that's really going to be rewarded in the workplace. It scares me that our sometimes our, our classes don't look like that. Flexibility. Big three, problem solving, communicating, collaborating. Absolutely. Switch over to today's meeting. Oh, no. I've lost it. There it is. Does anybody else do that? They get all these windows open, try to flip through them, and you're totally lost. Am I the only one? No? Okay. <laughs> I think so. Be a sad adult without an ability to laugh for yourself. That's a good one. Look at that. Think about the skills that kids are going to need. I mean, we think of all of those, those ones we were talking about before, don't we? Creativity, problem solving, critical thinking, all of that. A good sense of humor. Good sense of, of how you see yourself. That's huge. I love this. You guys come up with the best stuff. Do you realize that? You guys are awesome. Out of the box thinking, what are the possibilities of problem solving, perseverance, creativity, humor? Absolutely. That's great. That is great stuff. Okay, let's move on to question eight. How can we help students discover the right questions rather than the right answers? Think about that one for a second. Education has kind of been focused on providing information, right? Teachers have been the gatekeepers of information for all this time. Now we're getting information. It's pretty much at our fingertips, isn't it? You go, you go here, or you go to those devices that you got. So finding information isn't the issue anymore. It's what do we do with that information? What are the real questions that we want to answer instead of what's, that, what's the information? Instead of packing all that information in, we need to start thinking about those, have students think about those questions. So I'll be curious to see you guys' thoughts on that. All right, so let's take a look at some of those answers. I know I didn't give you as much time on that one. By the way, my iPad has been going nuts in my backpack. I just want you to see <laughs> Like, totally nuts. Not more. It's great. All right, let's see what we've got. This is on asking the right questions instead of the right, looking for the right questions instead of the right answers. By moving away from right or wrong questions and answers, ask them, what made you say that? Metacognition, absolutely. The process instead of the product, right? That's huge. When you have students practice asking questions, even dumb questions. Absolutely. That was Joe right there. Was Joe. I think, wasn't it? Yeah. All right, let's see. <laughs> Allowing students to follow their passions will open them to finding the right questions. Follow their passions, yes. If there's any way that they can pull in their own personal passions into what you're doing in the classroom, that's so huge. And another side to that, I think, is pulling in your own passion as, as a teacher. What are you passionate about? Because passion is contagious, isn't it? And if you can bring in what you're passionate about, whatever it may be, and incorporate that into class somehow, kids are going to catch it. That's great. Build curiosity. Can't choreograph our instruction to reward the product. We must focus on the process. Yes, absolutely. Jeff, <laughs> just excited that I read that for me out loud. I love it. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. There's another, I guess this is like the, the Dave Burgess is my co-host tonight. Do you have any lessons you can sell tickets for? That's the other big thing, big thing out of out of his book, one of the things that he's most famous for. Do you have any lessons you can sell tickets for? Those are the ones, those are the ones that kids are gonna remember. So let's go on to question nine. I got stuff to give away and I don't know how to time. 
I don't think you guys will let me not get stuff in my bag. <laughs> that is not an option. There it is. How can individuals make changes in a slow-moving educational world? Isn't that the question of the day? Doesn't that get frustrating? Education is slow to change as a as a institution, but we can be quick to change. That's that's sort of what Google fashions itself after: is to change quickly, iterate quickly, fail fast, try something new, come up with an idea that you think will work, put it into place. When it fails, fix it, change it, iterate, do it again until you eventually got it. Because if you sit back and you plan and you think and you plan and you think and you hem and you haw and you go, no, 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 I don't think that this is exactly right yet, guess what? There goes a whole other school year. It's gone. Stick it into place. That's what, on that, that Skype experience I was talking about, that's, I had no idea what I was doing and obviously I found out that my, my internet firewall was going to block a bunch of stuff. I didn't know that ahead of time. I was willing to jump in there and give it a shot. All right, let's see what else we've got here. Yeah. Two ears, one mouth. Listen to voice as long as you talk. Isn't that the truth? I love that. Wow, 15 more tweets already. Brainstorming without the fear of asking dumb questions. I'm using the questions as springboard to learning. Persevere. Don't give up. Keep trying. You'll eventually succeed. Yeah, perseverance. I mean, it's that continual. Pro I always think of it as a great big boulder. And if you're going to move a great big boulder, an, institu a, an institution like education is a great big boulder, isn't it? How are you going to move it? Constant pressure. Push, 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 push until eventually it moves an inch. And it moves a couple of inches. And then all of a sudden it finally starts moving. But it's that persistence. Love it. Making time for genius hour. There you go. Start small and take chances. Don't be afraid to take risks. Just do it. This is there's sort of a, a theme coming out of these, isn't there? Don't be afraid to try something. Be, don't be afraid to fail. I'm all the way back in Minnesota. How long enough one of my tweets gets read out loud? Mark, guess what? If you're watching, your tweet just got read out loud. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I think I probably better tell him in case he's not watching. Don't you think I got? I need to tell him? Yeah. No. Better idea. Talk about coming up with an idea right on the fly here. Let's see. Oh, I'm going to try to do this, and I don't know if it's going to work. Who was that? Mark French, Principal French. OK. Guess what we're going to do? <laughs> There he is. We're going to send a tweet to Principal French, and we're going to use the video again. <laughs> okay, let's flip it around. All right, you guys ready? Here we go. Everybody say hi, Mark, on the count of three. One, two, three. Hi, Mark. Mark, I think you got red in the session. All right. I love Twitter. Read your tweet. Hashtag to see 2015. Very good. All right, that's going out right now. Okay, we better finish up, huh? Let's go to question 10. Oh, not yet. Where specifically can we go to learn and get ideas and encouragement? This is the only one where I'm going to have one outlawed answer. Yes, thank you. <laughs> you can't just say Twitter. If you want to say Twitter, pick a specific hashtag. Or pick somebody that you ought to go follow. Or some of them. And if you're not going to say Twitter, great, come up with some other stuff. I say conferences like this are a huge too. If you've got a specific conference that really encourages you, stick that in there too. <laughs>
let's see what some of the answers to the question ten are. Last one, I can't believe we're done already. I can't believe that. That's awesome. What does that say? Thank you. Thank you. That's awesome. New spirit, not a person. Yes, very good. I love it. That's cool. Also important is play. And yes, I did read one. Melissa's got a lot too. Yeah. All right. Looks like we're not quite getting to. Ah, there we go. Thank you, Beth. Good quote. There will always be fear. Do it anyway. Let your courage inspire the world around you. I think there's a part of my book where I said, fear or not fear, um, change is messy and it's complicated and it's not easy, but we got to do it anyway, don't we? Even if it's going to make an absolute mess, change is worth is worth doing. Because I, I don't know about you, but sometimes the lives of my kids that I work with are messy. And the stuff that they do is messy. And by golly, I would rather them make that mess in school where I can stand right next to them and help work them work through that mess than to have to deal with that mess by themselves after, after they graduated. That's just being progress. Progress is almost always found outside of our comfort zone. Isn't that the truth? Oh, look at the same purchase. Yeah. Where? Down here? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's the same one here. Let's go run it up here and see what he says. Mark is like our guest of honor in this session. The Mount Sinai is an Thanks, everyone. There it is. <laughs> All right. Very good. OK. This has been amazing. But now it's time to wrap up. Time for a winner. OK. Now, actually, I think I've got these next two slides backwards. Because as soon as I give you a winner, then my hook to keep you here disappears. So I want to show you something really quick. If this whole ditch that textbook thing resonates with you, A, I've got copies here. B, you can get them on Amazon if you want to. Okay? B, number two. I'm getting all my A's and B's and ones and twos mixed up. We're starting a uh, ditch that textbook Twitter book study. And that's starting on Thursday. And I think I've screwed all of those times up. I made Eastern time earlier and Pacific time later, and it's backwards. <laughs> I am so time zone illiterate, you have no idea. And it's horrible because I live right on the Eastern Central time zone line. So the Central time zone one is correct. It is 9 p.m. Central, which means that it would be 10 p.m. Eastern. 8 p.m. Mountain, 7 p.m. Pacific, that's on Thursdays, and that's starting this Thursday. I would love to see any and all of you involved in that. And if you do Boxer, how many of you do Boxer? Okay, hands down. How many of you think Boxer is the most awesome way to get professional development? Some of you do, yeah. Okay, anyway, Boxer is like a walkie-talkie app. You remember the old sprint, push to talk? Same idea, only it's in an app. And so we're going to do one question from Ditch That Textbook every day in a boxer chat, a slow chat. And so if you're interested in doing that, you can talk to me, and I can get you hooked up right here. Or if you do Twitter, Jenny Wansley is the one who is setting that up. She's the boxer pro user who can add people to the group. So anyway, wanted to make sure that you knew about that. So. Did you tweet that slide? Yes, I will. Right after we're done, I promise. I will. I'll put it on the DTT SD1 and the SD1. So, okay. So now we can finally go to a winner. So, I have this very complicated website that I use for determining winners. I don't know if you've heard of random.org before. It's really, really complicated. So you have this little widget that's about to pop up here, where you give it a number range. So I just pulled up my spreadsheet with all the people who opted in. Holy cow, there's 101 of you. That is amazing. Okay. So, out of 101, I'm going to give away one book and one Ditch That Textbook t-shirt. So, number 77 is the book winner. Number 77 is Terry Lay. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> All right, you want to see me afterwards? Okay. So, Terry won the book, and then I have uh, different sizes of Ditch That Textbook t-shirts. So, if you win, you get to tell me what size you want. And the winner here is... Sorry, let's wait. 36. 36 is. Ah, somebody who's already got a Ditch That Textbook t shirt is here. Allison Pons. There she is. Do you have a copy of the book? 
No? Do you want a copy of the book instead? Okay, Allison gets a copy of the book. So I still gotta give that t-shirt away, right? <laughs> yes! All right. You guys are just like my students when we're playing bingo. I'm like, do you want to go again? Uh-uh. 65. Jillian Epstein. Oh, Epstein. Yeah. All right, there you go. You were a big winner. All right. So, like I said earlier, thank you so much for coming. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you have a wonderful rest of this conference. Thank you. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. Wonderful to meet you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Good see you that's right, yes. Yeah, so good to meet you too. Yeah, thanks for coming out.
This is my last one that I've got with you. So if you're ever waiting for one, I will have them. In my backpack, I might have one here with you, like later on the conference.
Andre. Hi. Good to meet you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. That would be great. We're watching that. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, they're over there. Okay. Yeah. 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 So you said that was uh, an interactive ebooks? Yeah. 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 So it seems like you guys did respond. You yes. don't have any books to carry out. I know, that's true. I'm embarrassed that I didn't bring enough of them to, to go around to. But I, I think there's only two people that left now. So hopefully we'll. Uh, I've been lugging around. It is, yeah. I've been lugging around about a dozen of them every day on my back all day. And so, <laughs> yeah, that's. <laughs> it's getting kind of heavy. So. Have you used that right before? No, I've heard it, but I haven't used it. Yeah, it's really good. It's like gray based uh, techniques. Uh, They walk in and say, well, How do you want to raise your own rights? And they immediately. Yeah, I'm going to put sessions together. 